Welcome to A Chat With Heart Podcast. I'm your host, Christina Martin. I'm here to guide us on this journey of heartfelt and uncensored conversations with friends I've met while touring my music in Europe and across North America, and people who have life experience that I genuinely believe we can all learn from. Our personal stories have great power to heal, influence, and inspire. All we have to do is show up for the conversation. If we just talk about it, we could shut it, we could break a dark day. If we just talk about it, we can cut away, we can make a better day. Hi, question. Do you have a bucket list? You know, a list of things to do before you die. My friend Shannon Churchill died in 2018 from colon cancer. He was one of a kind. He wrote his own obituary, and I'll share the link on the podcast bio and on my socials. But I'll tell you this, in his obituary, he encourages everyone to make a bucket list and start filling it in. He said, life is short and it only runs out. I should know I was only 44. My bucket list is pretty short because I feel like I've been so lucky to just do a lot of the things I really didn't dream that I ever would get to do. Uh, There's one thing on my bucket list right now that I'm working towards, and I don't know if I'll ever get to do it, but it doesn't mean that I shouldn't try. The thing on my bucket list is to perform my music with a symphony, like have a, a whole show. It can be a symphony anywhere in the world. I'm not going to be picky. And I have no idea if this dream of mine is going to happen, but it's on my bucket list and I'm, I'm taking the steps and I'm going to try. And, and that's, that's the best you can do. And then you kind of got to just like, let it go. At the end of this episode and every episode, there's a heartbeat hotline that you can call. I'm so curious to hear what is on your bucket list or, or have you already done everything on your bucket list? Or tell me one thing. Tell me one thing you've done on your bucket list that you were so excited that you got to do. And then I'll share it on the Heartbeat Hotline. Today on the podcast, we get to know my dear friend, Melissa Churchill, who was married to Shannon. Like Shannon, Melissa is one of a kind. And I think that's why they found each other. She has embraced her journey with grief. I know it hasn't been easy. And she's used it as an opportunity to talk about living life to the fullest, and to talk about Shannon. We're also going to talk about travel. That's something Melissa knows a lot about. She's been in the business for a very long time, and I know a lot of you out there are thinking about traveling again. Maybe you've already started to travel, and, you know, maybe you just want to have a conversation about it, you know, to get ready for planning your next experience. Maybe traveling somewhere special is on your bucket list. Melissa, we have known each other for 22-ish years. Freshman year, St. Mary's University. Um, We lived together uh, on the same floor for like a fucking year. C4, baby. C4, Vanier. Uh, I can't remember exactly what happened. I mean, I know I ran, I ran away for a couple of years and came back and then, and, and since then we've, we've kept in touch really. Mm-hmm. I wanted to ask you yourself today, yourself back then, C4 Vanier residence. What is the biggest thing that's changed about you other than your last name? <laughs> It didn't change too much because it still started with CH. It's funny. I, I've, I've said that before that I once was a Chown. Now it's a Churchill. It's still cha-cha-cha. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there's that. But funnily enough, actually, I joked, I joked here in my, um, in my career that for the first time in 20, how many years did we say? 22 20, years? I think it's like 22, 20 23. Plus. Yeah. Yeah. So in 20, in the first time in 20 plus years, I actually have finally dusted off my degree and actually it doesn't live in a closet. It's actually on the wall of my office now, which it Ooh. never has before. Yeah. So my, 
my my parents would be proud. They would be, or well, they, they oh, are. They, they're alive. They're yeah. here. Okay, yep, they're around. They're here for sure. So yeah, they're here. But yeah, so that's that's something that has changed. The forty the forty three year old Melissa has posted put up my degree from my 21, 22 year old Melissa, uh, finally for the first time all so these you, years later, you're really taking care of business. Finally stuff. I am. You're not, a, yeah. you, were you a procrastinator back then? I'm a procrastinator always. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I am. Yeah. So it's just, it's, uh, it's self rearing its ugly head, I guess in that regard too. Um, I made my way here with my bachelor of arts degree in English. <laughs> yeah. You should be proud of that. Melissa, will you tell my little heartbeat listeners what you've been doing, uh, for your pretty much your whole adult life for work? Well, after graduating from university with, with, you know, with our alma mater all those years ago, I've actually worked at a wonderful place here in Atlanta, Canada, CAA. And, a strange way to work through a career these days. I, I guess I'm a lifer. I basically yeah. been here my entire career. I mean, no one does that anymore. Like that's not the, that's not the, the cool thing to do necessarily. People are, are, are moving around, but yeah. um, you know, I, I've been here. Yeah. Essentially since 2001 and I've done everything from worked in member services. Um, I've worked in travel. I've worked in EV advocacy for electric vehicles and selling different types of insurance, travel insurance. And now I'm in um, basically a leadership position with CAA. So a few different hats, but with the same, with the same place. Yeah. And congrats on your recent, it's an upgrade or a uh, promotion. It's a promotion. <laughs> I hope it came with more money. I mean, um, I suppose yes. you're although you're <laughs> I will yeah. say, yeah. I will say, and I'm very proud to say that because I'm actually part of the reasons why I'm proud to work for CAA is the fact that we are not for profit. So we are a nonprofit um, organization. So, you know, because of that, resources go back to take care of things that should be looked after. So we have a, a great mindset that way. So there may be more money, but yeah. you know, I'm not buying an Aston Martin or anything. Not yet. No. Not yet. Okay. Yeah. It's funny you say Aston Martin. I'm about to interview my friend, uh, Chris Diston, who is a James Bond expert. Oh my God. Oh, can I be on yeah. with him? <laughs> oh, I am too. I feel like I'm too. I'm, Are you really I'm obsessed with bond? Oh my God. Like my, could... I can quote bond. I couldn't yeah. even tell you how many times I've watched the entire series of bond, what there, I own them. I have huge nostalgia uh, for bond movies with my dad. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. I that's wish fantastic. you could be on that episode. Okay. So let's be honest. It's been a rough few years for the travel industry. <laughs> so for, I want to say congratulations because you're still in it. Do you and everyone at the office despise the word pivot and adapt? <laughs> I'm actually getting a neck tattoo of the word pivot tomorrow. Um, <laughs> oh I, think, my God. I think I've decided I'm just going to get pivot right here. Um, oh my God. Right, right on my neck. I yeah. will get it. I'll get adapt. You get adapt. Okay, perfect. On I love the other it. side. And yeah, it's been a time. When this pandemic started, were y'all shit in your pants? Let's be honest. <laughs> So I can remember um, because I'm uh, because I'm a lunatic, weird optimist with things, and I, I'm a realist. But in the case of what this began as, I, was, this, I think a denial, this, <laughs> denial, right? Major That's what it was. Denial. In hindsight, we were all right? in fucking yeah. denial. Yeah. And, and by the way, by this thing, we're talking about <laughs> the pandemic. Okay, right. <laughs> okay. So you were in denial, which helped you survive. It's a great survival technique. Should yeah. we also tattoo denial? On, yeah, uh, but not the not the river in Egypt. To no, be clear, not denial. <laughs> not the that. actual the actual state of being. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, oh yeah. No, I was, so I, I can remember as the advisories came out and as the, you know, the, <laughs> the warnings came out and the get home, get home. I'm, I remember the video watching you and Dale over in Germany and you were saying how you were coming home in the big, in your big plastic, um, get bag. Up, I think yeah. the bag, Let's, right. Saying yeah. I'm ready to come back to Canada. Like, <laughs> so we were, we had no idea then what the hell that was all going to mean, but when I would I was, be, joking here. I was making a big joke about it all. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, but that's what we did. And that's human nature to, you know, survive mentally through things. So I, yeah. uh, I can remember sending in, I could, I was sending emails out to the whole company basically saying like, guys, don't stress. It's going to be fine. In a few <laughs> weeks, people are going to be back at it. It's all good. Like we're, it's, we're going to be on the other side of this and it's great. I probably should have been fired after that for, you know, giving everybody false hope. I don't know. Um, no, you, no. Pr- you probably kept people calm, which is <laughs> like what we still need. Yeah. So there was denial, but then it shifted quite quickly into it shifted into into rescue mode basically yes into panic uh, and rescue pretty quickly to get people you know back here <laughs> like were there people who were just like i want to keep booking things i don't care or- yeah there there were well actually i can remember a lot of people when we would re- we were doing our best to get in contact <laughs> with people who were, you know, have, I guess, probably not seeing the news and didn't have any idea. And they were having a great time and, and, you know, and basically said, you know, why would we come home? We're in Florida. It's warm and beautiful here. Why would we want to come back to Canada in March of, you know, but for the most part, I think once things, once shit got real, then it just went absolutely batshit crazy as we know with the media and the news and stuff. So yeah. you see cruise ships floating off the coast. And, you know, I had people that were, you know, stuck on cruise ships and that couldn't get back into Florida. And so they didn't know when they would get back. And then, so I'm talking to that you're trying, it was like one day you're wearing uh, the psychologist hat. Cause you're talking people off the ledge. And then the next day you're wearing a decision-making hat. Like it was, just, it was a whole bunch of different weird scenarios and weird things happening sort of all at once. But for the most part, I think a lot of the demographic that we tend to look after in book and whatnot are a little more cautious of folks. So we didn't see that a whole bunch of folks were were moving around after, you know, after literally after the crackdown happened. Ooh. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it got pretty dire pretty quick and then pretty dark <laughs> in the yeah. sense of realizing like, wow, what are what are we going to do until this is over? Well, it's just like even now today, Dale and I keep saying it's impossible to plan anything in terms of even having friends over, but we're also, but it's not just COVID it's now it's weather as well, but yeah. uh, here in Canada in the North, but yeah, we keep saying it's impossible to plan these days. Uh, and that's your fucking job or that was until you now are managing the office. Well, and it's, but it's still my job. I'm You're still, still okay. oh yeah, I'm still, I'm, and I'm helping everybody with that here in the office too, with their own situations. But, and I still, you know, I haven't, I haven't, lit a fire to all my clients and files. I'm still helping them out and navigating and changing and rebooking all stuff from, you know, two years plus. Um, wow. So yeah, it's, uh, it's still, it's still ongoing, but you know what though, you know, I do, I feel optimistic. Uh, here we go again with optimism, but yeah, I sure. do feel optimistic for this year, uh, 2022. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I feel like, I feel like we're slowly getting to the other side, whatever the hell that means. But I hear you. I, you know, I, I think it's still too, it's too hard to plan anything right now. And I know, you know, as, as devastating as it would have um, been and felt to, to kind of put, put Europe on hold again and for the tour for this year. Oh, right. I should fill people in. So we were on a tour in Europe in March of 2020, uh, myself and, and my partner, Dale, and it was March 16th when we had to fly home. And I booked all my travel for years. And I could tell you that when we had to change our travel plans quickly and get home quickly, it was qu- it was quite stressful. I know a lot of listeners out there uh, probably can relate if you were traveling at that time. So I didn't have any help or support. And then uh, during the pandemic, Melissa and I and CAA partnered up and we did a little... Uh, streaming series on Facebook called what's up with travel. And that was because like, we were all curious what, how, what's going on. I'm not the expert here. I wanted to get some, some Intel from Melissa and she was wonderful. So I decided, you know, back then when we were chat doing those chats, when I was going to book my travel again, that I would enlist the support of a travel advisor at you And so I did just that. We were getting ready for a Europe tour for the third year in a row. So our 2020 tour was canceled mid tour. 2021 was being booked, had to be rebooked uh, due to the pandemic. 2022, uh, we had 33 plus shows scheduled and 
with the o- Omicron spread uh, and so much uncertainty in, in Europe and most of our tour dates in Germany, Dale and I decided because the decision wasn't being made for us, but all the signs were there, this isn't going to be a good idea. And so we canceled the tour and my agent is rebooking for fall 2023. Mm -hmm. Now I enlisted you to help with the flights. You took care of it all. When I needed to cancel them, you took care of it all. You managed to uh, figure out that I was eligible for a refund all that stuff. And I had more things you were going to help me with. It would have been a devastating decision to have right. to make about the about having to cancel 2022. It was very hard uh, on me emotionally for a lot of different reasons. But I can say that the decision to to have you take care of that side of things was really helpful to me. And after I made the decision and, you know, I think everything got a little bit easier from there because once you know you know, what you're doing for the next four to five months. And it's predictable. It's like, it just removed a lot of stress for me. Um, So that was nice, but yes, it it was heartbreaking, but there are a lot of positives and silver linings to being able to stay home and work from home. And, and uh, so now I'm, I'm optimistic about being able to stay home. If somebody wants to book travel now, what kind of things, tips are you advising people on Uh, Like, what should they know now? Mm. And when will it change again from what we know today? Yeah, like completely (laughs) different tomorrow. Do you just have a standard, you know what, folks? Everything's up in the air. So plan for (laughs) that. Right. Exactly. Use an advice. Like my my advice would be, I'm not the expert, but uh, is hire an advisor, a trusted advisor. Yes, absolutely. That's been one of the major focuses and and realizations and i think for many people is to navigate all of the information the restrictions the requirements the advisories and there's a lot of misinformation too i mean get people on board to help out when that's what they do they they are experts in it or they will be happy to find out the information for you i mean we're all busy the world is busy you know you're busy every but to find the time to try to figure it out it's it's fun it's a weird time because even though the pandemic is essentially still ongoing. Yeah. I think people don't realize, I think they feel that because so much time has happened, has gone on since it all began that, you know, there can't be all these measures and restrictions in place still for travel. So I think a lot of the time people that are say booking directly or, or, you know, just pressing the button without realizing what you have to do. So one of the main things that I think we counsel to folks or say to people right now is, you know, at the end of the day, it's an individual decision and it's a personal choice as to if people feel comfortable to travel, of course. And I'm never certainly going to make that decision for them. It's it's up to every individual. But, you know, people have to understand that you need to realize, I guess, what what could happen or or be prepared that you know, you may have to spend X number of dollars out of pocket to potentially, you know, quarantine until you can come back to Canada. You may have to spend hundreds of dollars right now for additional testing. Um, There are papers to fill out for each country um, and COVID certificates. And oh, my God, this is giving me a I know right? who, wants, who wants to go anywhere. <laughs> stay, 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 <laughs> right? They yeah. need this information, though, to make an yeah. informed decision and exactly. not not yeah. Um, yeah. really panic later on. We would never, ever instill fear in people. That's not our job to do that. Um, and and people still can and do travel. There are ways to do that. People are getting on planes and going places. It's just knowing what needs to be done to make that happen, basically. You know, at some point, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see what happens once there's more restrictions lifted. Um, other countries are loosening up restrictions, so there's no crystal ball to know, yeah. of course, when Canada will do the same. But um, that it, we're here to provide guidance or at least a conversation about what uh what you know what people should be i guess mentally prepared for yeah. if they're going to be looking at traveling something i'm extremely passionate about and very vocal about and that i take to heart and very seriously one thing that i have realized through this 
in the sense of the travel role is that I, I take the element of sustainable traveling very seriously. Yeah, tell us um, more about that. Yeah, so I, um, I, I'm going to be working on some initiatives and task force coming up from a CAA perspective as to the approach towards sustainable traveling, because even myself before the pandemic, you know, and I love to travel and I have sold travel for many years, but I really felt and witnessed there were times where it would feel gross in the sense of over tourism, right? And, and really impacting a community or an area in a negative way. So I think there's ways to explore responsibly and to appreciate a place for what it is, you know, learn new cultures that get outside your comfort zone, but to really be impactful in a positive way on, on local community and sustainable sustainability versus things that are bad for the environment, things that are bad for, you know, the people that live there. Um, so that's something that I'm really, I've taken to heart. I, I feel very passionate about that. So I'm, I'm pretty excited to be involved in working towards that goal as best as I can. I mean, I, I can't save the oh. world, but I certainly want to try to educate whenever possible. So I love it. I'm excited. Sounds like you're paving the way there at CAA. And I'll be watching because, you know, feel free to use me as a test, a test uh, person. I was going to say test bunny, but then that would be promoting animal cruelty. And I'm a vegan. <laughs> and I just really have to think about your words. These, You know, like it's true. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, feel free to use me as a test, a test person for sustainable travel adventures. Um, sure. Dale and I are getting the itch to not not to tour as musicians because mm -hmm. we are, um, I feel like if I were on tour, I would get sick because that's yep. what I'm hearing from every touring musician is that they're getting sick. Mm. So I don't, I don't want to tour and play music right now, but to just travel as a tourist uh, mm -hmm. in a beautiful place and learn more about the culture, um, Dale and I are getting an itch. Uh, nice. So we're not maybe ready quite yet, but mm -hmm. Uh, it's on my to-do list. So I'm, I'm open to, you know, ideas of, it could be local too. Sure. Could be, okay. Could be Atlanta, Canada. Could be, um, could be Iceland. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, those two places, Atlanta, okay. Canada That's or Iceland. <laughs> Give me some Which ideas. I'm, okay. Uh, I'm open. <laughs> For sure. When we were planning on going to Europe this year, I did find solace in the fact that there were some pretty good insurances available that weren't a year ago or two years ago at the beginning of the pandemic. And that's something that's definitely a very important piece for travel moving forward. I think I can remember back in the day um, when first selling travel and even before selling travel, when I was sort of working in membership and selling travel insurance in general, even to folks that were driving, let's say, to a destination. And <laughs> so many people, I mean, you would bring up travel insurance and people would look at you like you had two heads. They would say, what? I mean, I don't need that. What are you talking about? I think there for many years was an assumption that the government might look after you or you wouldn't have to pay out of pocket. I mean, yeah. a very different mindset. So over time, and especially over the last couple of years, there's definitely become more of an awareness of the importance of having some form of coverage, some way, some somehow yeah never, so never leave home without without it i mean, never I leave go, home without it yeah to the grocery store but like yeah. out of province yeah but even yeah. out of province it's yes. a good idea yeah. to have travel insurance if you get in a car accident yeah. i don't know all the ins and outs but i i that would be an expensive accident well if you want me to sound fatalist not that i want to be fatalist because that yeah. seems counterproductive oh. but yeah a, a, an example would be like let's say if you were in another province and there was a terrible an accident or something happened that put you in the hospital want if you were to be air ambulance back to nova scotia um that's not covered under typically under any health any provincial health care coverage so things like you know bringing you back home um for treatment here or whatnot mm -hmm. um any anything to do when ambulance is involved that's not um that's not a covered provincial thing so yeah you're absolutely right out of province medical insurance um can be huge because there can be sort of costs incurred that you wouldn't expect to be the case in yeah ontario quebec bc wherever right so and i um, and i say this as a caring citizen who is yeah. has always lived paycheck to paycheck and always been nervous <laughs> about leaving the province without insurance. I've always bought it for all of my, any tour that I've been on. 
yeah. um, in Canada or overseas for myself and the musicians that I've hired, because you, I mean, again, I don't want to instill fear in anyone, but I'm just a realist and exactly. shit happens. Accidents yeah. happen. And if you're already a struggling artist or struggling <laughs> human, oh, it's such peace of mind. I have been sick, yeah. uh, you know, on tour and used um, the insurance. And the insurance, you know, it really isn't that expensive, to be honest. Until we turn 85 and have, you know, chronic health conditions, maybe that's the time when it makes more sense to stay home. Until you <laughs> turn 85 and you have Until chronic I turn, health exactly. issues. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yes, that's the, the right way. That's exactly. Right. The limit. <laughs> but no, at, uh, it, you know, and, and that's, and honestly, that brings up a good point. I mean, if you're going to be traveling don't or doing things, adventures, it, no matter where you go, don't wait until if you can do it, don't wait to travel until it's too late. Um, which we, we see happens too, right. Until you're, Oh, good point. Uh, way to segue yeah. into something yeah. positive. That's I know. Right. Exactly. That yeah. goes right into a, a good, a goodie. I've seen it happen time and time again, where people wait until retirement, people wait until they've done their careers or their, you know, they now all of a sudden have the time and the funds and their kids, if they had kids, they're, they're raised and gone and everything. But I mean, you know, it, it may not necessarily be the prime time of when you're going to want to be out exploring and really doing some things that could push the limits. Um, I'm a, I'm a live in the moment person anyway, as you know, and for obvious reasons. Yeah, so for it's, good reasons. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> Dale, you know, I love conversation games, right? Yeah. Well, when the pandemic started and all of our tour dates were canceled, we did what so many other musicians did. We started gigging online, and conversation games helped me connect and engage with an online audience. So right now, you're going to read a card from one of my favorite conversation games, and I'll answer it. This question is from the game Fluster, which our little heartbeat listeners can buy at www.flustergame.com and save 15% with my promo code Christina, 15. Ready for the question? Yeah. All right. What's the worst job you've ever had? Oh, my goodness. The worst job I have ever had, I was 18 years old. This would have been a job after my first year university, and I answered an ad in the newspaper that sounded really exciting. There was opportunity for growth personal growth and financial growth. I learned really quickly that I was going to be doing door-to-door -door sales, but I did not know that when I went to apply for the job. I was hired immediately, and the first day on the job, I started selling $20 lube packages for automobiles, and it was miserable. It was terrifying. At times, it was really awkward. But then there were times that this job actually helped me get over a little bit of my shyness. Like I had to do things that I wouldn't normally do sober. I think I might have even like sang and danced to try to convince people, to you know, to, yeah, to buy these lube packages. I mean, it was a low point. In Nova Scotia, in, you know, in the spring summer and fall, it can rain a lot. And I remember that being one of the really miserable parts of the job was just being outside all day, rain or shine. So it was either super, super fucking hot or humid and wet and gross, really cold to the bone. And, and then I would, I would, I just didn't like annoying people. It just I, seems like an 18 year old going into strange neighborhoods, having to go into strange people's houses by yourself. It seems absolutely ridiculous and unsafe. Yeah. Did you sell anything? I did sell packages. I absolutely did. But I hated it so much. And I so I quit after two weeks. And yeah, that was probably the worst job I've ever had pretty bad 
I'm going to segue into something right now. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Today, earlier, I had a good cry. I rewatched the beautiful CBC story called A Bucket List for Him, but also for Her, hmm. which featured you, Melissa. Can you tell us about the significance of the bucket list for you? I was really touched when CBC contacted me. It was a year after Shannon um, Shannon Churchill had had died, my my husband um, from cancer. So he, it'll be four years on Monday um, wow. that he died, and I can't believe that it's been four years. It feels like a a, a heart a heartbeat. <laughs> there, yeah. there we go, heartbeat in a way, but also a lifetime ago. It's so strange, right? Grief, yeah. as you know, grief and time is is an odd thing. Um, yeah. So CBC had reached out a year later when Shannon had died, and he had written his own obituary, which he would have. I mean, tongue in cheek, he would have died laughing at how how viral that went. He had planned his own obituary in advance, and I he had typed it up with me. I didn't write it at all. It was all Shannon, but he would read it to me. What was how was I going to criticize his own obituary? There's no way that I would have anyway, even it was if, if I had thoughts about it. But it was so kick ass, you know, because yeah. it was Shannon. Yeah. So so I, I can remember typing it up for the you know for the newspaper here the the, the chronicle herald and uh, sending it off um and then the morning that it came out i get a phone call it was one of the media outlets and i thought what it, it hadn't even crossed my mind that this would be you know something to talk about and then it just went from there and i i thought about it at first and and when um i was contacted to to possibly talk about him and his obituary, you know, and the person that he was, I debated it because I thought, you know, I was grieving. He had just died. But a couple of things I thought he would he would think this was the funniest thing ever. Yeah. that It had the reach that it did and that people responded like this. So I thought, OK, there's that. But I said, it's Shannon. So I thought I have to talk about this man. I mean, for those of us who knew him, he deserved to be talked about and 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 to tell people who this, you know, who this person was. So that was all all well and good. And it, and it truly went viral. I mean, it went around the world. News stories picked it up. There was just such a huge, massive response, which was just priceless. And then a year and then a year passed and, you know, we taught I'd done a couple of um, chats, uh, interviews, just talking about, you know, what what the impact of his death had meant for me and, and what I could see for myself moving forward. You know, that he had taught me, you know, how to live the rest of my my life. So a year later, the CBC did reach out and, and we had that, you know, that follow up um, bucket list interview, which. Uh, which was really special. I loved, yeah, I loved how it was done. And yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, right. It's, yeah. it was just, it was so, yeah, it was really lovely. And uh, Shannon had talked about his own bucket list and the bucket list is such a, it's a, it's a catchphrase, right? I mean, it's a buzz, a buzz word that people use. And, and I, uh, I, I would call it that, but I'd also just refer to it as as living a living a good life, right? Doing things that are meaningful to oneself, making those things happen. It can be as small or as big as you want it to be. And and Shannon had one, and I, you know, I had uh, I had slash have one. And even if those things don't get accomplished, all of them don't get accomplished, or or even just. To be, it's it's just the fact that you had those dreams to begin with, right? Yeah. You have those aspirations and those goals. That's it. That's well, all that matters. What was what were some of the things on Shannon's bucket list that did get checked off before he died? He had had big ones that he'd wanted to check off in his life that he did do. Um, even in the few in the years leading up to when he did when he did die, because he he had cancer and then it went into remission and then it did come back and spread cr pretty quickly after that. So in in the good time in when he was in remission there, he'd always wanted to um, travel to Ireland and have a really extensive trip there. He's got family history there and it just it felt very meaningful to him. So we we did manage to get to Ireland and have a very special trip there. Um, he'd always wanted to have a motorcycle. So he rode the hell out of his motorcycle. And, you know, even until he couldn't ride his bike anymore, he was you know, <laughs> he. <laughs> It's funny, actually, I he always promised me that he, you know, when he would drive his bike, he was was driving it safely and, you know, under the yeah. speed limit and everything. Yeah. So after he died, I learned the truth from what? people that told me like, oh, no, Shannon didn't tell you the fact that he would like take that 
bike and ride the piss out of it on the highways and like go completely balls no. to the wall. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> because he knew oh. that I would be like Shannon, what? So like, oh yeah. yeah. He was that was his nature. He was always very He was he a was liar. Pretend- he, he was, was a, a liar. Fuck, fucking yeah. liar. He was a liar. Exactly. <laughs> he was a terrible person. He was amazing. But like hit but hit that was his nature was to, you know, if there was something that would, you know, <laughs> upset me, it was yeah. best for me not to know. Well, so of course. But yeah, and then and then leading up to before he died, um, after he found out that he that it, his cancer was completely terminal and that it wasn't going to get any better, um, he decided completely on basically quality over quantity. Um, and we'd had those conversations as well about you know how to spend that time that that remained, however long that would would be. So with with basically the last three months of his of his life, he 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 was able to take some medications and do things, different steroids that gave him some really amazing days and felt he felt really good until that changed. Um, So during that time, in the few weeks is sort of leading up to, I guess, say Christmas of 2017. It was random and crazy. Like, you know, we were (laughs) we were doing everything from going up to the air traffic control tower at Halifax Airport and hanging out with the guys there and them showing us the ropes about how to, you know, do that. He was riding in a harbor pilot boat out, you know, guiding in one of the massive container ships into Halifax Harbor. He went and got into a cage with a lion at at Oaklawn Park. Um, It was just it was so random and just crazy, like all these random things. He you know, we had we had a, a, a large gathering of our friends and family into one of the theaters at Cineplex. In I remember that. Bears Lake. Yeah, to, because he he never he had always wanted to get to the Grand Canyon and could never get there. So so we had a we had a big viewing there. So just a whole random mishmash of little things, but that were so meaningful. Yeah. Special. Um, and, and a lot of them just came sort of in the moment. But my God, I mean, I can't think I'll probably get emotional here, but I can't think of any more beautiful ending to anybody's life, frankly, with being able to do, you know, these things and have these experiences. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I'll, I'll never, I'll never forget that time. Oh my gosh. I'll never forget that. I thought we almost killed Shannon when we brought him some (laughs) medicinal marijuana oil. And that was Mm -hmm. actually the night before the the viewing (laughs) of the Grand Canyon film at the IMAX theater. And I thought, oh, oh Shannon's <laughs> really not looking too well. He, I, I hadn't seen him having to be propped up by people. Oh my god! And I thought that's it. You know, I, I actually wasn't aware that he had taken. I didn't know he had sampled it. And we show up, and Shannon's being propped up. He can barely walk. And I, I, like, I think it was only a short time before that we had visited, and yeah, wasn't doing that bad. I think, I, I think it was actually not long after I. I attended one of his chemo sessions with him. Yep. Mm-hmm. So I was like, holy fuck, he's just gone downhill here. And then I got a text from y'all later telling me that he had taken this marijuana and it just totally wiped him out. Like he was still super fucking high. And 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 I it was a bit of relief, but I also felt horrible because everybody probably I oh. think he I think he was, you know, doing <laughs> okay around that time not great but like he wasn't he didn't have to be propped up on a regular basis until much later maybe no oh my i'll so. never forget so that so the funny thing was if he knew that he would be seeing lots of people he wanted to be feeling really good right no pain so he did he had a you know a little dollop of yep. the cannabis oil and ingested it and so we were getting ready to leave and he looks at me and karen and said I'm fucking high as a kite. He's like, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. <laughs> and, Karen, and Karen and I said, we're going to, we're going <laughs> to somehow make this happen. You're going to be fine. And he, I, I could never, I'll never forget the look on his face before we left the house. Like he looked, he was so stoned and was so oh. out of it. So we piled him into the car and off we went and Oh the one thing God. that I remember, like I at the divorce, so we get there, he's, you know, talking to everybody, doing his best, but like you said, looked like he was yeah, on death's door because yes. he couldn't walk. Yeah. And so my we're fault. all my right? fault. <laughs> <laughs> you are the one to thank, thanks slash blame, uh, I guess. Like, yeah. No, 
anyway, and so we're there and um, getting <laughs> getting through it, and we watched the movie, and then, um, but before we, it was actually before we watched the movie, <laughs> Shannon leans over to me, and we're sitting in the in the seats, and he leans over to me, and says, Melissa all these people are here. He said, you, you have to be the one to stand up and talk. He said, I can't even stand. He said, I can't stand up and say <laughs> any words to anybody for oh. being here. And he said, and I want to show my love and gratitude to everybody for coming. He said, but I can't, there's no way that I can, that I can function. He said, can you oh. get up and talk? So, so I said, oh my God, of course. Yes. So he's there next to me, like completely just gone, completely gone. Oh and God. so I got up and, and so, and I had so many people like, like you said, so many people afterwards, you know, messaged and they were like, Mel, like, is this, is it any, is this it? like, seriously, like, this is it. Like he is so, and I said, no, no, he's just, he was high as all get out. <laughs> it's all fine. It was Christina was Martin's fault. Stoked. Yeah. It was Christina's fault. Um, She's, she gave him like super high grade, you know, cannabis oil, you know, uh, THC to the nth degree. Like it's all, I, it's all yeah, good. I shouldn't, oh, I my shouldn't, God. I had never even tried it. I just, you know, because my yeah. friend who who I got it from, he he had cancer and uh, used it or used it regularly, and was mm-hmm. like, just take a little, you know, put a little dollop on a cracker and on a cracker. Like, okay, yeah. I'll pass that along. And <laughs> yeah, anyhow, my apologies, but uh, oh, great <laughs> memories. No, don't apologize. A little, a little bit of that went an extremely long way. Yeah, so it yeah. was, it was, it was, it was good shit. It was really good shit. All right. That's good to know. Before you guys left on tour in um, in January, when well, when you took Flat Shannon along, oh, that was, we're gonna have to explain Flat we'll Shannon. To, before you guys left for the tour in it would have been January of of 2018, and you took the time, you know, and that was when things were known, and it was known that probably that would be the last time that you guys would that you would see him. Um, but again, he was very he only wanted to see certain people that he truly, truly loved and cared about and trusted in that, in those few weeks, because you would have seen him probably, yeah, two to three weeks before he actually, before he died. And, uh, and I remember, I remember you guys coming over into the house in January and us sitting on the couch and shooting the shit. Yeah. Um, You know, he always cared about other people more than about himself. So he wanted to spend time and, and for it to be as normal as possible. Right. I mean, he'd never wanted cancer to kind of to define who he was, but it meant so much to him to have had that relationship with you and uh you know that oh. that you guys took the time and that he wanted you to be a part of his life too so yeah oh so that was so hard because i part of me wanted to hold on to that idea that you know what like maybe he'll he'll make it to like june when we're back or may yeah. and 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 uh yeah but I kind of also, part of you goes, this might be it. It's a really hard, it, it was a great visit. I remember it very fondly. I remember the look on his face when we were saying goodbye at the door. Like I knew that he kind of had that thought too, like this might be yeah. it. And it was very, very hard. Yeah. And uh, of course, and there's no question of like, I, it's not going to stop me from going as hard as like it, it's going to yeah. be to say, <laughs> to leave. You know, I'm not, and I'm not saying goodbye because we, we didn't, because we, and, and, and I came up with this weird fucking way of like <laughs> always having him with us. Let me explain. So flat Shannon was, I can't remember some, some child gave us something called a flat, some somebody flat Henry or flat something. It's like a Wasn't thing. It a dog. Did you have a flat dog? It was, no, it was like a no, cutout. It, it was like a cutout of a, a young child, but like a, <laughs> uh, a stationary cut together. It was called flat something. And we took it with us. And I don't remember who gave it to us. And when we were on tour, we would do photos with this flat being and hashtag it. And like, eventually passed it on to somebody to continue the legacy of this flat being. So anyway, uh, a couple of years later, I was like, Oh, we'll make a flat Shannon. So I asked Shannon for a photo of himself. We, uh, I laminated it and made it nice and small so I could put it in my, my planner and carry it, you know, around with us. So we, we announced to Shannon the last time that we saw him in person that we, he was coming on tour with us. I thought he'd get a kick out of that. And then I whipped out the laminated tiny version of himself propped up against a tree looking uh, super uh, 
super happy and I don't know, like Shannon suave. and yeah, suave. <laughs> and so, you know, we would take pictures of flat Shannon uh, and all the places we would be in Europe and then uh, send them your way. We have a, an Instagram account that still is, uh, I'm, it's not active. And the reason why is because I lost flat Shannon like multiple times. And for a while, like flat Shannon was getting sent back to us, like by the venues, I'd leave them at, in the green room or mostly at the venues after the show, I would forget them. And then sometimes they would yeah ship them to us in Germany. Um, or we'd managed to go by and pick them up before going to the next venue. Anyway, so Flat Shannon made it to Europe and and uh, lived beyond, had a life beyond Shannon, Shannon, human Shannon. Yeah. And we did our first tour in Newfoundland and Labrador, <laughs> 2019, mm-hmm. and we made it to Burgio. Mm-hmm. And in the I middle of nowhere. <laughs> middle of the fucking butt fuck nowhere. Um, <laughs> one of the most beautiful places with some of the most beautiful people in the world. And we played at this uh, Legion and I had Flat Shannon pinned up on the dartboard behind us where we were performing. And I don't know what the fuck happened to him. I went in the next day. I couldn't find him at the Legion. Like I've, I've left him there. I forgot him. And I scoured the place like the garbage. And I asked all the there were like people working there doing renos or something the next day. And I was like, have you seen Flat Shannon? And I'm trying to describe to them what this thing is. And they're just looking at me like I must not be well or something. And so then I told you about Flat Shannon and losing him. And you told me that that was actually one of, probably a very appropriate place and way for him to disappear. Why was that? If he, if Flat Shannon was going to go away anywhere, <laughs> first and foremost, I mean, Newfoundland was Shannon's homeland. So you yeah. can't get any better than that. And he was a huge darts fan. I would come home so many weird. times and Shannon would be, and, and I didn't have a sweet clue about darts very much in, until I met Shannon and he started watching darts more and more over the years. So I would come home so many times and Shannon would be watching dart championships. And <laughs> I, he knew all the players so that he got me into it. So we would watch darts um, wow. out of the UK and the Netherlands. And anyway, so, and we had, so, you know, it, it got, it got to be so big that we, you know, we did buy a dart board. He and I would play darts together all the time. We were getting into it. And as a, as a matter of fact, we, <laughs> darts was so much a part of life, kind of, that the, the actual day that Shannon, at the beginning of when we kind of found out that he had cancer, um, we found out that he had cancer from his appendix rupturing, basically, appendicitis ru- and then it rupturing. And the night that his appendix ruptured, we were in the middle of a very competitive darts game. Wow. And, and he stopped as we were playing darts and said, oh my God, Melissa, I have to lie down. And he did. He went and lied down. And then, you know, it, eventually, yeah. it shit, literally, yeah, literally it, it, it went sideways. But uh, but yeah, dart, darts were a thing for sure. So if he was going to go away forever, Flat Shannon, yeah, it, it had to be Newfoundland and it had to be on a dartboard. So, I mean... Like, it just doesn't seem like a random thing. It just seems like Shannon had some hand to play in this. This Right? I mean, like a a dart. Yeah, like a dart. Thanks, Shannon. Yeah, thanks, Shannon. Always always looking for a good laugh and make people smile. Uh, Oh, my God. That was very cool. And, you know, to be honest, I was, uh, it's a lot easier to tour with just two people. If Flat Shannon was kind of taken up. (laughs) A little bit of my headspace, and so it was time for much <laughs> and it to was. retire. It was and yeah. lay, you know, lay and rest. And well, and you got to see Shannon um, memorialized. I guess is that the right word? You you had a an oh, experience yes. with Shannon at the afterwards at the chesses, fish and yeah, chips. I certainly did. So uh, I hope I can. Sh- can I share this story? Mm-hmm. I don't want to be offend anybody. No, you go for it. All go right, for it. it's okay. it's real life. It's what? real life. So chess is for, for anybody who's never been to Newfoundland and Labrador, it's a fish and chips yes. restaurant in, is it exclusive to St. John's uh, the, or, or is it also in, I believe they have, I mean, there's several locations in St. John's 
Mount Pearl. I think there might be a location in Carboneer. So okay. I, they're not widespread across Newfoundland, as far as I know. I don't think there's one in Burgio, for example. No, there's not. There's Angela's no. Restaurant, which is fantastic, but um, there's I didn't remember any other places to eat. So it's a, but it's it's well known. Like if you're going if you're going to St. John's, you're gonna go and try it out, unless you are not into deep fried things or vegan. Um, so I guess I'll never go again. And, but any case, enjoy the experience that time. So we went because you had said this, you have to go here. This is this Shannon would religiously, how often would he eat Jess's? He, uh, every day okay. um, at a minimum. So his parents, they created a memorial bench for Shannon at the kind of the main chesses in St. John's. And there's a, we, when we went, there was a beautiful little, little plaque with a little story introducing people to Shannon that I believe his mother Mm -hmm. um, wrote. And so it was lovely. And, and, you know, but I gotta say, um, and I did tell you this after uh, Dale and I were reading it and it was like, you know, this is Shannon Churchill and lover of life and whatever it said, I can't remember, but I wish I I had it here to read to, to you. I do remember hitting the point in the story where it went on for a bit about how when Shannon visited St. John's, he would eat chesses every single day. And immediately something clicked in my brain and Dale's as well. And I mean, this is a guy who died of colon cancer. Yes. Yes. Had anybody put together (laughs) the facts? Deep fried (laughs) food. I mean, um, could this have been the thing? Right. You know, I mean, I don't want to blame one one thing, but uh, it just was very. It just seemed so clear to me at the moment, so much that it was almost comical. And then I thought, my mind went to, um, you know, is there a lawsuit here? Could could this right? benefit Melissa in some an, way? An expose. Right. And uh, but I I I didn't make that public until now. And uh, we're of course we're we are in, this is all in jest, but it was kind of, that's where our minds went when we were reading that. Well, because we appreciate, that's right. We, we all appreciate dark humor. And the one thing Mm -hmm. I will say though, is that, you know, you know how they always say, if you're going to die, it's, you know, if you die doing something that you love, yeah, then that's, that can be a thing. So, Hey, I I know Shannon would say if, if, if it was chesses that played a role, I mean, it was worth it. He's he'd be fine with that. I I know for a fact he would be completely fine and accepting of that. One hundred percent. There you go. And then this is a great advertisement for chesses. Their fish and chips are to die for. They are to die for. Okay. well, listen to to uh, before we we wrap things up on a chat, this episode of a chat with heart. uh, One more question for you, Melissa. What does love look like for you now? (laughs) It's really great. I have a lot of love for so much in in life anyway, and so many people um, that I love and care about. I feel grateful that I feel like I've had two immense loves of my life, and I, I'm very happy in a relationship with someone who means a hell of a lot to me, and he was actually Shannon's best friend. His name is Jeremy, and we are um, a very tight tight, tight pair. Um, we've been friends for, for many, many years. In fact, we also dated before. I mean, there could be like a weird, I don't know, like a, a full circle kind of weird. I, it's all, maybe it's incestuous. I don't know, but it's no, not, but no, to be clear, it's, so, you know, great. it's, it's, it's definitely, I, I could make, I don't know. I could have a Netflix, uh, series, I think sometimes with, with kind of how life has gone, but, um, no, he, he, he's, he's a wonderful, wonderful human. One of the things that I'm, you know, very grateful for is that I can always be completely transparent and real. And uh, it's hard for people who are widowed, especially at a younger age, or that lose their, you know, that lose their their partners and their loved ones. I mean, going into the relationships afterwards can be very, you know, daunting and unknown and scary. And then there's also an element for the people that they're with. I think their their new relationships that can I measure up to what was the past relationship? Yeah. There's a whole lot that can come with that. But 
the beautiful thing is that, uh, you know, Jeremy loves Shannon too. So I'm, I'm able to share in talking about Shannon, you know, he understands the grief. There's never any judgment and there's just a whole hell of a lot of love. Like, uh, yeah, I'm super, super grateful. Um, I have such a wonderful time with him. Um, and you know, life is really good. It's just really, it's really happy. I'm grateful. Not that I wanted to see Shannon go, of course not. If he had to go, I also know, and I've said it many times, I think, well, well, one of his biggest thoughts was that he just, he wanted the best for me and wanted to see me happy. Um, And if he knew that, you know, that Jeremy was here and that we were super, super good and, and, and happy together, I think he'd be pretty, he'd be pretty chuffed. So, I mean, if he is sending us messages like with flat Shannon on the dartboard right? disappearing yeah. and that whole, I mean, you know, he's watching and I bet he knows. And he might be, he might be jealous. There might be some weird jealousy there. Well, I mean, if you start having darts flying around randomly and like starting to hit Jeremy, maybe, I mean, I'm so happy for you and I bet Shannon knows and fuck it if he does. <laughs> <laughs> he's his, gonna he's gonna yeah. have to deal. At his this loss, point. his yeah, loss. I guess. You know, exactly. you sneeze you <laughs> chesses. He can blame chesses. Yeah. You sneeze you, you know. lose. You yeah. sneeze you lose. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you so deserve it. And oh, I'm you. so happy for you and Jeremy. Thank Hi, Jeremy. You. It sounds like a blessing to me. I say, whenever I say blessing, I, you know, I'm not a religious person, but no, me neither. I, I know, I but like, I know what you mean. I say I, that I know too. Yeah, yeah. You could say yeah. it if you're a spiritual person, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Even just for uh, fun, you can say blessing. Just okay, for, cool. You know, I love it. Giggles. Yeah. Um, bless you. <laughs> Listen and tight. Yeah. Oh. Bless you too. I love you so much, <laughs> Melissa. I, I'm just so, um, I'm blessed that you shared so much about your life journey here in the chat with heart and i'm blessed that you're my travel advisor (laughs) and uh yeah again this is not a sponsorship the sponsored uh episode here by caa but if you do want to get in touch uh with melissa eh, do they have to be in canada i can't remember no 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 anywhere any anywhere yeah, Japan. Yeah, yeah, we want Iceland. people to come here as well. Right. Yeah, get in touch with uh, we Melissa. Do. How, how, so how can people get in touch with you? They can certainly reach out. Um, I'm fortunate that I have an amazing team here um, at CAA in general. I will I will give a shameless plug. Um, okay, yeah, please do. No, <laughs> I really please will. do. Yeah. I will do a shameless plug. CAA is a national, is a Canadian national company. We're all divided into different regions within Canada, but um, we've been here the whole time working tirelessly to help our help people throughout the last couple of years. And we take being essentially trusted travel professionals very seriously. Um, we've all done courses, we've done training to stay on top of it. And, you know, CAA is, is definitely a trusted brand within Canada, a trusted name. So you, you can't go wrong if you reach out to CAA, no matter who you talk to, um, you know, we're all, we all take it very seriously with what we do. So um, certainly don't hesitate to, to check us out, reach. We all have, you know, we've got websites, we've got um, our bios on there. We've got all sorts of great information. Um, so certainly if, if anybody needs any assistance, certainly uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much, Melissa, for encouraging me to do this in the first place and, and uh, being so supportive. You, you're one of my biggest supporters and I really, really love you. Thank you for your friendship. I'm happy you're happy. Thank you, Christina. I love you so much too. I'm so happy for you and I'm so proud of you for everything uh, you've done and accomplished and continue to do. You are a massive inspiration to me and to many people. Um, and I'm so thrilled that you're doing this podcast. I think it's going to bring very, you know, great things to you and to your listeners. So much uh, love. Thank you. Let's go for a cross country ski soon. Sounds good. Welcome to the Heartbeat Hotline, 1-902-669-4769. I'm the host of A Chat With Heart podcast, Christina Martin, and I'm so excited you called. Leave me your question, a suggestion for the podcast, or a comment about this episode. Please be aware your message may be used on the podcast and social media. 
Tell me your name, where you're calling from, and it's also fine if you want to remain anonymous. Thanks for listening. Have a great fucking day. Hi, Christina. It's Tom calling from Moncton. I want to say I love your podcast. I feel like similar to the first time I heard you sing, and it used to like make me cry because you were so fucking talented, and that's how I feel about this podcast. Um, you're doing such a good job. I love every episode. I feel like every single episode is just getting better and better. I just listened to the one with Devin and Walker uh, from the game Fluster, which I will be buying. Um, it sounds amazing. It sounds like exactly um, the kind of game to play with friends. Um, having a couple of drinks around the campfire or wherever. Especially interested in the new sexy pack. That sounds really interesting. You know, keep doing what you're doing. I absolutely love your podcast. That was so great to hear, France, on the Heartbeat Hotline. I went to junior high and high school with France in Grand Falls, New Brunswick. And she was one of my best friends. She still is. She's also coming to visit me this weekend with another best friend of ours, Julie. And I've not seen Julie in a decade. There was a a group of seven of us girls who were very, very, very close. If there was a party planned by one of us, we would all be there. And we all played volleyball together. Some of us were on student council together. And each and every one of these girls had a big impact on my life in a good way. We made a lot of memories. We laughed a lot. And also, these were girls I experienced a lot of my firsts with. First time drinking, first school dances, first time smoking cigarettes, swapping stories about our boyfriends. We helped each other with schoolwork and whatever the hell we were struggling with on and off. I spent a lot of time at their houses and we all spent a lot of time eating Connie Duffy's famous chocolate chip cookies huddled around Michelle's. Uh, Kitchen Island, that was very much the central hub for a lot of us to hang out at throughout the school year. Molly, France, Julie, Sarah, Cheryl, and Michelle, uh, thanks for the memories. Thanks for helping keep me on a good path. I hope I wasn't too bad an influence on all of you. A Chat with Heart, produced and written by me, Christina Martin, co-produced and engineered by Dale Murray. Check out Dale's website, dalemurray.ca podcast theme song talk about it was written by me and recorded by dale murray you can find it on all the places you stream music production plans for this podcast and season one are supported by the province of nova scotia's women in business implementation fund and the creative industries fund special thanks to terence taylor for mentoring me on hosting this podcast and really digging deep with me on my production plans for season one, which, let's be honest, Terrence, ended up being more like well-needed psychotherapy for me. To Crystal Seeberger at Sensory Friendly Solutions, thank you from the bottom of my heart for helping me learn how to be a more inclusive, accessible, and sensory-friendly human. Visit my Patreon page to become a monthly or yearly supporter of this podcast and my music endeavors. If you're new to Patreon, it's a membership platform that helps creators get paid. Sign up at patreon.com forward slash Christina Martin. For this to be a massive success and reach 7 billion people, I need you to share, rate, leave a review, and subscribe to A Chat With Heart on all the places you listen to podcasts. Wishing you, my little heartbeats, a great day.